So you have been bulking, you have been training, you have been lifting consistently and getting stronger for a while now. You have achieved milestones such as a 250 pound bench press, a 400 pound squat, whatever goals you may have. So firstly, congratulations are in order. You have busted your ass in the gym and now you get to reap the rewards by lifting more than anybody else in the gym and looking like a total badass. But guys, at the end of the day, it's awesome that you're strong, but we have to accept what's most important. Abs, chest, shredded arms, cab, what? What, nope, so, so no calves. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's fine. That, that works for me. That's... And guys, let's face it, 95% of the people watching this video and my channel are doing so in the pursuit of aesthetics. Or if you want to go by the more technical, you know, proper terminology, looking sexy as hell for girls. You know, the, the people that probably don't really care what your deadlift is. If they even know what a deadlift is. So guys, the purpose of this video is not to dictate exactly what's going to happen to you, the viewer, but what happened to me. In science, oftentimes, when we have conclusions or results, they're often much easier to validate when you have a higher sample size. So guys, a little quick scientific lesson. When we are doing experiments and we have subjects, test subjects, um, the bigger the sample size, the more, for lack of a better word, legit the study is and the findings are. If you have a sample size of 1,000, or as we like to call it, N equals 1,000, and you see some kind of effect for 10% of the population or 100 people, we can safely assume that if these individuals do whatever it is the study is looking at, you know, 10% of them are going to get this effect. Why? Because 100 people is a big amount. It's way too much for it to be simply an anomaly or a coincidence. However, in this specific situation, when we are using myself as a, you know, the guinea pig, the test dummy, the sample size is essentially one. So guys, this is not 100% what's going to happen to you. However, I am going to use myself as an example, which you could compare and contrast with. Take this more like one case study, a very thorough case study, a very thorough, well-researched and informative case study, which I'm doing for you guys and asking for nothing in return. Nothing at all. What? what? Oh, oh man. Sorry guys. I, I don't know how that, you know, how that got there, but you know, while it's there, come on guys, do it, do it, do it, do it. I know we want to do it. So guys, you know what time it is. Sit back, take notes, and bitch, get ready to learn. So since I started training way back in 2006, 2007, when I was about 14 to 15 years old, I have been persistently in some type of, you know, at least maintenance, usually in some kind of lean bulking or bulking um, phase, pretty much being in a calorie surplus, pretty much going for increased muscle and increased strength, which is why I've been consistently gaining strength over the last, you know, seven or eight years up until 2014. This is the first time that I decided to compete in my first men's physique slash bodybuilding competition. I went from about 200 pounds to 178 pounds on stage. This is not as lean as I would have like, liked to be, but it was my first competition. And I still think I broke probably nine to 10% body fat. I was pretty lean in the upper body, but as always, my lower body needed a lot more work. So I got some notes here because there's so many numbers and I want to remember you know, what I was doing two or three years ago in terms of strength. So just a couple of examples, and I'll probably throw a lot of this on screen right now. Guys, forgive me if I don't have footage for all this. We're looking you know, one, two, three, four years back throughout my lifting career. Lots of this is pre-YouTube, so I have to like dig it out from my external hard drive or from my phone or from like my old Instagram account, which is even active anymore. Back in the winter of 2015, this is right after my first competition. I bulked back up, I was about 205 pounds. Um, I regained my original strength. It probably took me like one to two months. And I started making new strength, new muscle gains. Now this at the time was the strongest I've ever been. So for example, on the squat, I was doing 315 pounds for 11 reps. This is a really high volume PR. Like at this point, 315 felt, it felt like nothing. It felt like, you know, not even a working set, a little bit less than that. And in addition, I was able to do 405 pounds on the squats um, for a double, a pretty decent high bar uh, double. Later that year, in the summer of 2015, I decided to compete in my second competition. Now, a lot of people will tell you that your second competition is always going to be better, it's always going to be easier, and yes, that's exactly the case. I was able to diet longer, diet harder, um, but at the same time, it was easier. It's like I was able to get leaner, but you know, I knew my body a lot better, and in doing so, I was able to reach almost nine pounds less than I did the previous year on stage, despite probably having the same amount of lean body mass, meaning that the only difference in weight was probably less fat. I was able to break probably 8% body fat, getting as low as 169.8 pounds on stage, the lightest I have been since 
I was like 18. The problem is around that time, I remember the month prior to the competition when I was training, it sucked. My squat was down to 315 pounds. Honestly, I think I remember doing about two to three reps and like three almost killed me, which sucks because I'm essentially doing the same number of reps as I used to do on 405. So it's like I lost the whole plate, like 90 pounds of strength just wiped out. Fortunately, the next off season, so earlier in 2016, I did another powerlifting competition and I was able to get my squat back up, you know, it recovered and then some just a little bit more, I got it up to 425 pounds. Speaking of that powerlifting meet, I also did 320 pounds on the paused powerlifting style bench press, which for those of you that don't know, it's probably about 20 to 30 pounds less than what you can do touch and go which for me, the heaviest I've ever gone is, I think it's 335 or 345, I'm not sure. So about, I said, you know, 20, 15, 25 pounds heavier than what you do paused. In the summer, pretty much right before my previous competition back in August, I would still bench. I never tested my one rep max because when you're that weak, when you're low on calories, low on carbohydrates, the last thing you wanna do is, you know, go for like a one rep max and potentially, you know, snap something up. So I was able to do, I was working with weights like 225, for a set of eight, not multiple sets, but that's, you know, that's it. 225 for one set of eight, and then I was done. It killed me, which if you plug it into a one rep max calculator, it comes out to about 275, 279. For the deadlift, this was a similar case. Um, in like February, March of 2015, I was able to do 515 pounds in the gym. I kind of did like a little mock meet by myself to see, you know, test my one rep maxes. And then, you know, fast forward about half a year later, when I was like in the middle of my competition season, probably actually closer, you know, to the end when I was just about to step on stage. I remember I did this kind of like one motivational video and it was kind of like. You know, those cool music and I was deadlifting and it was intense and it made it seem so cool. But I was doing 405 for like, I think I got three, not even four, like, yeah, just three reps. And that was it. So to go from doing 515 for a one, which I can, at that weight and that strength, I could have probably done like 495 for a triple, all the way down to 405 for a triple. Once again, it's like I lost an entire plate worth of strength. All right, guys, in summary, I wanna throw up a chart on screen right now. This is pretty much my strength levels over the last couple of years. You know, since I started competing um, back in 2014. And as you can tell, every time there's like a peak, every time I'm at my strongest, is when my body weight is at its highest, you know, probably 200, 205. That is when I was probably competing in, you know, powerlifting or just, you know, in the middle of, you know, my bulk. Every time it drops is the opposite. That's pretty much when I was dieting down for a competition, whether it be bodybuilding or uh, usually it's men's physique. And that's when my strength takes a big hit. Now, the one thing I do want you guys to understand, and I want you guys to notice this, is that overall the general linear trajectory is still up. Every year I do lose strength and every, you know, the following off season, I do come back and then some. I'm able to regain my original strength and then add an additional 10, 20, 30 pounds on top of my um, previous one rep max. So am I still getting stronger in the long run? Yes, which is good. However, I do think that I would be able to gain more strength and gain it faster if I didn't have these, you know, these bottoms, you know, if I didn't bottom out every year during the summer. However, that's not my goal. I am first and foremost a men's physique competitor, a bodybuilder, someone who trains for aesthetics, uh, someone who may want to put on some mass and at times I'll put on some body fat, but my overall goal is to achieve an aesthetic physique, you know, with good structure, lots of mass and at a relatively lean body fat percentage, sometimes dipping down to a very lean body fat percentage. So guys, what I want you to take away from this is that can you still get stronger, you know, following this kind of like uh, cyclical bulking and cutting routine? Yes, but you have to understand there are consequences. You are not going to get as strong and as fast as you could be had you just said screw it and spent one, two, three years in a consistent lean bulk. This is not universal. I am not saying that each and every one of you is going to experience this the exact same way to the exact same lifts and in the exact same magnitude. For example, there was a great interview done with Eric Helms who I've mentioned multiple times on this channel as one of the few individuals you know, in this industry who I truly you know, respect and whose advice I truly value. And in this interview, he mentioned that for him, pressing movements, that was the first to go. And only the first thing to go is pressing. I don't know why. That's something I found with almost everybody is they'll lose their pressing strength. And in addition, he was actually able to lose, I think it was about 14 to 15 pounds and not only retain, but increase upon his current um, squatting strength. But yeah, I mean, I remember I started being able to squat like 405 for a triple in 2011. And then and I was like, started my diet at 200. I hit 184 and that, that, like that week, I hit 405 for two sets of four on squats. 
So I've gotten a little stronger. Now the crazy thing for me is that this is the exact opposite. Like my bench press, yeah, you know, all pressing movements, um, they do kind of take a hit and it's, it's fairly reasonable, but my squats, like my legs, they're just obliterated. They're the first to go and they're the hardest to go. I've never understood why, perhaps it's because, you know, the amount of cardio that I do um, during um, the cutting season, perhaps it's my low carbohydrate, relatively low carbohydrate diets. But like I mentioned earlier, guys, 405 reps for a double drop down to 315 for somewhere around a double to a triple. We're talking like 80 to 90 pounds of decrease in strength. And it just goes to show that, you know, every individual is different. I am able to retain my pressing movement a lot more than my squats, whereas for the case of Eric Helms, it's pretty much the opposite. All right, guys, the second part of this video, the more sciencey stuff, the good stuff that you have been waiting for, we're gonna try to explain why does this happen? I mean, we get it, less carbs, less energy. Yeah, it sucks, but on a biochemical or physiological level, what mechanisms are actually at play which lead to such drastic strength decreases in some cases? Number one is lack of carbohydrates. Now, there are some people out there who slash their carbohydrates completely. We're talking ketogenic diets where carbohydrates are essentially 25 grams um, or less. This is not something that I personally advocate you know, for most individuals, unless it's absolutely required. And in addition, this is not something I follow. I personally try to minimize the amount of carbohydrate depletion that I am doing. I would much rather take away from fat and salvage carbohydrates. But even then, if you're in a decent calorie deficit, eventually you are going to have to take away some carbohydrates uh, if you want to spare protein. In doing so, you're going to decrease the amounts of two very important molecules situated throughout your body, directly correlated to energy performance strength, pretty much everything. The first one is glycogen. This is a molecule I've talked about multiple times on my channel. It's pretty much like a slightly longer term um, storage mechanism for uh, sugars. So we're talking like longer chains of polysaccharides. It's stored in the liver and most importantly in the muscles. And it is very important for energy to drive you through those hard, intense workouts. So less carbohydrates, means in addition to less glucose, it's also going to mean less glycogen. And this can be problematic if you're going for, you know, longer, harder workouts. Second molecule is ATP. This is the body's fastest immediate source of energy. It doesn't provide a crazy amount of energy in the long run, but for like quick stuff, we're talking like a one rep max. Uh, this is the body's primary source of strength for that one rep max. Calories going down means your carbohydrates are going to go down, which means your glucose levels are going to go down, which means your ATP levels are going to go down. And in doing so, your one rep max, your ability to elicit maximal force production for that heavy one rep max, it's simply not there. Another big problem, and this is pretty much unavoidable when it comes to natural bodybuilders, is you're going to lose some muscle on a calorie deficit, on a cut. The harder you diet, the longer you diet, the more muscle you're going to lose. You can mitigate this, which we're going to talk about later in the video. You can try to minimize the effects of this, but it is pretty much unavoidable. If you did a big diet for 12 weeks and you lost 25 pounds, you know, good for you. You probably lost a lot of water weight. You lost mostly fat, but in addition, you probably lost a little bit of muscle. It sucks, but it's, that's just how life goes. So guys, in addition to low carbohydrates and less muscle, Another third big problem is decreasing testosterone levels. Guys, as we all know, testosterone is the main anabolic hormone responsible for you getting bigger, getting stronger. It's no surprise that most anabolic steroids are simply exogenous um, synthesized derivatives of the male sex hormone, testosterone. And one of the things which makes testosterone just take a nosedive is low calorie diets. In fact, there was an excellent article it was called Natural Bodybuilding Competition Preparation and Recovery, a 12-month case study. Testosterone levels declined from 9.22 nanograms per milliliter all the way down to 2.27. So, what the hell? I mean, that's almost one-fourth testosterone levels at that point retaining, let alone building new muscle and strength. Damn, that is hard. And unfortunately, there's another pathway which could lead to decreasing testosterone levels during a calorie deficit. So, when you are dieting, this is putting physical stress on your body. Probably psychological stress too, but we're gonna focus on physical stress for now. This is going to increase levels of cortisol, the human stress hormone, and cortisol has been found to have a directly negative relationship with testosterone levels. So cortisol goes up, testosterone levels go down. And you guys may be wondering, why does this happen? What does like metabolism and low calorie diets have to do with testosterone, right? One is essentially, you know, related to like development and sex. And the other one is related to like metabolism, energy. They kind of seem like two vastly different systems. Yes and no. Once again, with the body, everything kind of like works, you know, in homeostasis, kind of works in balance. So when your body, you know, is dieting, it doesn't know this. It doesn't think that you're dieting to look good for a photo shoot or a competition or, or you know, or whatnot, to look good for the beach. It thinks you're starving. It thinks you're dying. And this, you know, like when you're about to die, 
Um, reproduction and you know, sex is usually not the first thing that should be going through your mind. But on a more positive note, the main question is, can we do anything to stop this? And the answer is no. Judgment day is inevitable. Just kidding, guys. There are a few things you can do to lessen the chances of this actually happening, or at the very worst, mitigate the effects of this. So, you know, instead of dropping 100 pounds on your squat, maybe you'll drop, you know, 20 to 30 pounds. Number one, guys, is simply take it slow. If you were originally planning on dieting and losing like, you know, 20 pounds in you know, eight weeks, maybe push it, maybe make it 12 weeks, maybe 16 weeks, take it slower, um, start dieting on a lesser calorie deficit. So don't immediately jump into a negative 500 calorie deficit, maybe start on something like negative 300, then jump up to negative 400, then maybe slowly, you know, start adding cardio in, don't just, you know, immediately go from zero to 100. Me as an online personal trainer and coach, I have worked with hundreds of people and they're like, you know, I can count the number of times I've put clients on a 500 calorie deficit right away, I can count it on like one hand because those were specific um, situations uh, for specific individuals. But usually I start them on something a little bit less, for example, negative 300, maybe like negative 300 plus a little bit of cardio. And from there we will ramp up in case they hit fat loss plateaus. Number two is up your protein intake just a little bit. So when you are maintaining or when you are bulking, you can get away with slightly lower um, intakes of protein. We're talking 0.8, grams of protein per pound of body weight, which I've mentioned in a few of my videos, and um, that's fine. But when you're cutting, your body's a lot more prone to metabolizing ingested amino acids for the purposes of energy, meaning that you have less amino acids, which is just the building blocks of protein, you're having less protein. So even though you're eating whatever, you're not potentially able to use all of it to synthesize and preserve muscle mass because you're in such a low energy state that your body's literally using fat, it's using carbs, it's using protein, it's using anything at all, which can be broken down into calories. So to compensate for this, you want to increase your protein just a little bit. We're talking one gram of protein per pound of body weight, maybe a little bit higher towards 1.1, 1.2, just a little bit extra to overcompensate and ensure that your body is not going to metabolize you know, amino acids, or at worst case, actually break down your actual muscle. And uh, this could mitigate the amount of muscle mass that you're going to lose on a cut. Number three, I kind of talked about this earlier in the video, is simply maximize the amount of carbohydrates you are going to be um, eating. So if you have X amount of calories to work with, you've set your calorie deficit, and you have set aside X amount of calories for protein, which is non-negotiable, you kind of have like, you, know, you, you have fat and carbohydrates to work with. I advocate putting fat as low as you can, um, while still remaining, you know, at a healthy, reasonable level for testosterone synthesis and just general body function, and then putting the rest of it into carbohydrates, which could mitigate and minimize the amount of like energy and strength loss that you're going to take, again, because of things like glycogen depletion. Number four is carb cycling uh, and focusing on pre-workout nutrition. So you're not going to be training every day and you're not going to be training hard every day. You may have really hard workouts like, you know, one to two times a week, maybe like a really high volume back day or kind of a heavy uh, leg day. So in that case, I would advocate putting more calories, more carbohydrates um, on those days. Or if you work out in the mornings, putting it the day before, maybe around nighttime. So let's say you train faster in the mornings, like before work or before school or something around seven or eight in the morning, have a good dinner the day before and actually go above your target calorie um, intake and decrease your deficit. Now you may be thinking, well, what are you doing, right? I mean, you're going to diminish your body's ability to lose body fat. Not necessarily because you're going to have a lower day, um, maybe like the next day or something. You're going to have high carb days, low carb days. At the end of the day, think of fat loss on a weekly level. So if you're going to do a deficit of 500, you could theoretically have a deficit of negative, you know, 700 and then a deficit of, you know, negative 300 and you're gonna have, you know, it's gonna even out to 500 for both those days. So if you try to minimize your deficit, maybe even taking it all the way up to maintenance on days when you really need those calories, you really need those carbohydrates for heavy, intense workouts, and then you make up for it on days when you're sitting on your ass for a rest day by eating a little bit less than your targets, it kind of balances out. And overall, you're still eating, you know, in a good calorie deficit, your week is still safe, you're still in fat loss mode, However, you were able to kind of like divert more calories and more carbohydrates on the days that you actually need it. Those heavy, high volume, intense workout days. Number five is consider, and I know this sucks, but decreasing volume, you know, just a little bit. So 
for example, let's say you're doing six exercises and you're doing like four sets each. So a total is about 24 sets. Maybe you can, you know, knock off one, maybe two exercises at the most if you feel that they're kind of like, you know, bonus and they're not 100% required uh, to your development. Maybe you threw them in when you were lean bulking because you kind of liked it, but it's not 100% required. Or on the other hand, you can keep all those exercises, but you can maybe do like three sets for some of those um, exercises. Whatever it is you want to do to decrease the total work capacity in the form of less volume, that can make your workouts a little bit better because if you're having less energy, there's no way you're going to sustain the same work capacity, at least not at a decent intensity level. And we do not want to compromise on intensity. We want to maximize intensity as much as possible. Obviously it is going to go down as your carbohydrates, your calories go down, but you gotta fight it, man. You gotta fight it all the way, you know, tooth and nail till the end, because that fighting is what mitigates the amount of muscle mass and the amount of strength that you are going to lose. So consider decreasing your volume just a little bit to salvage and save your workout quality, your workout intensity. Okay guys, that is it. I apologize if this video went very long, but welcome to my channel. Bodybuilding is like investing. You're going to have to give something up in order to get something back. And hopefully what you get back means more to you than what you lost. I like being strong, but I will lose a little bit of strength and I'm okay with that. It sucks and I will try to mitigate it as much as possible and decrease the magnitude of strength loss, but I'm willing to accept it because I want that low body fat percentage. I want that aesthetic physique. That is my goal first and foremost. So guys, my question to you is before you begin a cut, whether it be a little cut or a big cut or a legit competition prep, can you accept the consequences? Because I sure as hell can. Okay guys, that is it. Thank you so much for watching. I appreciate each and every one of you guys uh, for taking the time to come and stare at my face for a little while. If you learned something new, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And if you didn't learn anything new, you know, subscribe anyway, because I need the views. And as always guys, if you're interested in getting a lot more serious about your physical development, you can always hire me as your one-on-one -on -one online personal trainer via my website. I'll leave a link down in the description below. So at the end of the day, bitch, did you learn something?